Good morning and welcome to this morning's reflection. We continue to read from the work of Ronald Rollheiser. And in an essay entitled Crying Out for Real Community, he says the following. I clipped a letter out of a magazine and a lady was explaining why she had trouble accepting the Christian faith. And she wrote, Do not talk to me of God or come to my door with tracts or stop me in the street to ask me if I am saved. Hell holds no threat more agonizing than the harsh reality of my life. I swear to you the fires of hell seem more inviting than this bone-deep cold of my existence. Neither speak to me of church. What does the church know of my despair? The church barricaded behind its stained glass windows against the likes of me. Once I heard your pleas for my repentance and I sought a fellowship of faith within your walls. There, there I saw your God reflected in your faces, yes, as you turned away. Forgiveness never came. The healing love I sought was carefully hoarded and reserved only for your kind. Be gone from me and speak no more of your God. I have seen your God made manifest in you, a God with no compassion. So long as your God withholds the warmth of human touch from me, I shall remain an unbeliever. Mari Livingston Roy Wisdom lies in simplicity. This letter is powerful because it is simple. When we do not experience the warmth of human touch, in the end we will not believe the gospel. This is so true. Ultimately, we cannot even honestly preach the gospel when we cannot offer community to those to whom we are preaching. We cannot preach it honestly, not because people might look at our lack of community in our lives and say, well, you aren't practicing what you're preaching. But because when we cannot offer community to people, we put them into a position whereby hearing the gospel they find themselves in an intolerable but hopeless situation. The gospel challenges them to leave one life behind, but does not offer a concrete road to a new life. When we preach and teach like that, and we are all prone to do it, we end up like the scribes and Pharisees of Scripture, laying all kinds of burdens upon people with the word of God and not being of any value at all in setting them free for new life. We can illustrate this. When the rich young man asked Jesus, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus answers, sell all you have, give the money to the poor and come and follow me. However, when Jesus says, come and follow me, this expression literally means come and move in with us. Be part of our community. Jesus challenged the young man to give up everything. But he offered him an immediate alternative within his community. For example, suppose that after a homily on social justice, a man approaches and says, I'm convinced I will go today and sell everything and give money to the poor and follow Christ in a much more radical way. 
But then afterward, what should I do? How should I then support my family? We would have no answer. We could not tell him as Jesus did, come and move in with us. We could not concretely offer him a community that would absorb and support him and his family. And so the original homily on social justice contains an element of dishonesty. We might be challenging, but not offering a real alternative. We might make people feel guilty, but not offer them a way out. And this holds true for a lot of our preaching. For example, sexual ethics. There was a lady in her late 30s. She was, in her own way, a sincere and committed Christian. But because she was unmarried and lonely and unable to find deep faith, emotional and effective support, she was prone to sexual affairs. And she in no way justified these morally. But she did justify them emotionally. Simply put... She knew that they were a compensation, something second best. And she put it this way, right now, where I am, lonely, single, frustrated sexually, envious of those who are happily married and have children, these kind of affairs are a compensation for all I don't have. They are better than nothing. It is really hard to challenge her on this without being able to offer her concretely a community of people who could provide for her something of an emotional, effective and faithful support that she would need to be strong enough not to fall into that kind of relationship. Like the rich young man in scripture, she often walks away sad both from her affairs and from a Christ she knows at a deeper and truer level inside herself. However, her guilt is less than the rich young man's. Nobody and no community which is truly representative of Christ has ever yet said to her, leave all behind, come, move in with us. Christianity will have power when we have vital communities which can concretely offer an alternative to the second best compensations that our world offers. When the touch of human warmth, genuine community is withheld, we will always have a lot of unbelievers and a lot of of struggling believers. This is a tremendous challenge that when we preach and teach and we draw people toward Christ and we ask them to leave something behind, what alternative do we offer them? May that be a topic of prayer for today. Amen.